freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your recap episode for this week's Arnold Palmer Invitational. We were on the verge of an eight-way playoff, which before we went hot, I then said, do you guys remember that seven-way playoff for bronze in the Olympics? And then they said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. And I said, name them. And we have currently named six of the seven. These three, Kyle Porter, Patrick Rodonald, Greg Ducharme, in a, they have been going back and forth. I said, let's just start the show. It'll give you an extra 30 seconds to see if we can figure it out. So here we go. Uh, let's see if we've, we've got it. Patrick McDonald, one guess. Um, the He's last looking one. at you're looking it up. Don't look at no, I, no. I'm doing editorial duties. I'm double double tasking right now. Uh, Europe. I, I honestly have no idea. Bob I gave him a hint. Are. It was no, that's wrong. I gave him a hint. <laughs> I the, know. Hint the hint was Europe. That's Patrick Gonzalez. Greg Ducharme is here. Greg, guess. Uh, Bernard Langer. That oh is wrong. <laughs> no, I'm, like that. I'm, 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 I'm teasing. Uh, was it? Um, uh, why do I feel like it's his name is Miko? Um. No, Miko's, it's not. Uh, Miko Kornin? Phoenix player. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. No, it's not him. Not him. Okay. No, Kyle it's... Porter is here. Kyle, who is it? It's somebody from uh... – it's somebody from like Belgium or somewhere in that region. Is It's Western Europe? Uh, you guys are going to smack yourself. So what? do you want another hint here? Do you want the – I can't give Shane you the Lowry? country. No. I'll, I'll tell you he's uh, currently a member of Live Golf. Does that help? Um, mm. Yeah, those are my boys. Let me think here. Polter? No. Paul Casey. Give, 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 give me Paul Casey. There yes. That's a good one. That is correct. Rory McElroy, Colin Morikawa, Hideki Matsuyama, Paul Casey, Mito Pereira, CT Pan, Sebastian Munoz, seven men from seven different countries battling it out for one solitary bronze medal, which was won by the bread man, CT Pan. The bread man. Of course. There you go. Now we can talk about the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Greg and I last night switched it up a little bit. We have a lot to talk about, but we switched it up last night and we kind of went chronologically and the feedback that we received was pretty strong. You know, you set the table, you do a little context, you build things, Greg. It was fun. We basically talked people through the day of golf as opposed to talking them through a reading of the leaderboard. Right, which uh, very they're very different things, and in this tournament especially, they are very different things because things change so quickly. I mean, just thinking about how. Oh, first of all, what a week, by the way. Um, but second of all, oh yeah, just think. Just, <laughs> there like, it is. Thinking about uh, thinking about who is going to win this event and how many times it changed. I mean, there must have been twenty five people through this week that I thought for sure were going to win. Uh, and Kitty Yama popped up a few times. Rory popped up a few times. Scheffler popped up a few times. I mean, it, the list goes, Spieth uh, was on and off the list um, seemingly every other shot today. It, it was just unbelievable how unpredictable this thing was. Zooming out, Kyle, our Friday night lead was nine under par. Our Saturday night lead was nine under par our Sunday night winning score <clears throat> nine under par. That certainly did not stop the throngs of stars lining up behind and on this leaderboard. It, you know, there was what nine guys within one shot, like with five holes to play on Sunday night. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I don't know, you know, the, the thing about, what do, what do people always say about great courses? It it, it 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 means there's separation, like on a leaderboard. We've talked about this at U.S. Opens in the past. And Bay Hill just kind of provides um, like carnage on a leaderboard, which is a different flavor. I don't know if it's – I think it's just I – mean, I think it's fun. Like I, I thought the, the – I thought the golf on the weekend was extraordinarily fun, even though – I think you could argue like, hey, maybe the setup or the course or whatever isn't as um, good or I don't know what the right word is for that at, as, as like a TPC Scottsdale or, or Riviera, you know, and uh, I just, man, I, I thought this weekend was I just, I, the designated events rock. Like, is that OK to say they're just awesome? Like, it's just been so much fun. 
not to throw this in there. I don't love that they're changing next year. We, Rick and I talked about that for four hours on Thursday night, but it's just been a ton of fun to cover this stuff for the, uh, over the course of the first two months of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Electric. Uh, some of the names that were in contention were the biggest names in golf. Patrick, that's ideally what the PGA Tour wants. And Bay Hill was getting, yeah, I, I don't know about like course architecture wise, but people are saying, oh man, this, this, could, this could host a major championship. This is tough. You could see the, the green starting to get really yellow over the course of the weekend. I, I looked this up uh, during our preview. Did you know the state of Florida has never hosted a U.S. Open? Oh, come on. I did know that. Really? Huh. Um, that, seems I, in, that seems impossible. That's what I bunch thought, of, but bunch yeah. Of PGA, I guess, they, they posted yeah. some PGAs. Time of the year is probably not conducive to it. It's too hot. Too hot. Yeah. Rainy. yeah. Uh, but what, what I love about uh, kind of these events so far is the parody of, you know, we have the Nick Taylors of the world, Keith Mitchells of the world, Kirk Kitayamas of the world contending with these big dogs. You know, each time one of these lesser known players – kind of top 50 with Mitchell and Kitayama uh, going against Rom, going against Rory, going against Scheffler. And it's just added so much more to it. Like, yeah, it, it was great watching Homa and Rom down the stretch there at the Genesis, but kind of having these guys late into the tournament hit the golf shots needed to win the tournament in Kitayama's case, like that, that sequence on 18 was disgusting in eight iron from 180 yards. 17. 40, 45 17, feet, 17 following a three putt on 16 uh, and just really the ability of his of Kitayama to rebound this week is what stuck out to me. It could have gotten away from him uh, in the third round early on that par five fourth and it could have gotten away from him on the ninth today and for him to kind of just batten down the hatches and keep trucking along was unbelievably impressive. Unbelievably impressive. Let us set the stage for old Kurt Kitayama because it was hours prior to that, Greg, where Davis Riley goes out, goes out and shoots a 66, fires 31 spots up the leaderboard, Eagle on 16, Birdie on 18, and now two decent finishes in a row for Davis Riley. Trying to get back on track, T29 at the Honda, and then he's going to end up finishing T8 here at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Yeah, a lot of really high expectations last year for Davis Riley um, and coming out of college, especially. But he came on the scene at the Valspar last year and really started to play some great golf. And he was, in a way, rivaling a, a Cam Young for a rookie of the year thing if he was able to get a win uh, before Cam Young did. And so he, he was really in a, a separate class. And it's just been sluggish ever since. Uh, but the Honda was really nice and and... The cool thing about the Arnold Palmer Invitational is you go shoot one great round of 66 and all of a sudden you find yourself in a really good position on the leaderboard because uh, they just seem to rise and fall, but there's not a lot of total movement as far as the place is concerned. So this was a great round for him. He finally got the putter going. Uh, the ball striking was, re was really high quality today as well. Um, and he just filled it up with some birdies and eagles. So really good stuff from Davis Riley. 77 66 on the weekend 11 shots difference for davis riley keegan bradley kyle said anything you can do i can almost do it was a 67 for keegan that featured one two three four five birdies just one blemish on the card to sneak himself inside the top 10 for the well top 11 for the third consecutive year at bay hill yeah, uh, just somebody had him in their in their bets this week, right? Uh, I did. Yeah, I did. There you go. <laughs> nice. Uh, playing great golf, you know, in a Ryder Cup year. The U.S. Ryder Cup team, of course, Kurt Kitty on the wins, and I lead with the U.S. Ryder Cup team. But <laughs> let's do it. Let's it's gonna him. be a it's gonna be a, a war. I mean, it's gonna be it's going to be super competitive. I think with a lot of guys, Fowler played pretty well this week. Um, uh, Kitty Yama's American. Mm -hmm. Yeah. UNLV guy, Chico, California, UNLV running rebels. Yeah. I don't know if they're still the running rebels. They might just be the rebels. Now. <laughs> 
who can say? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, really impressive from from him, especially. Um, what was the scoring average on? I've got it right here, actually. Just a hair under half, half a shot under, so yeah, seventy one point nine, I think. So pretty pretty impressive final round from Keegan. Tiger Woods, American. Webb Simpson, American. How about this? Uh, I didn't know what to expect, Patrick, when Webb Simpson bogeys eight, doubles nine, and then rattles off six in a row from 12 to 17. It kind of gave us a little bit of what could go right coming in on this inward nine. But the the, the low-key other thing is uh, Webb, Webb gets to go to the Players' Championship next week is has has web found is this the is this the round that all these guys are looking for one swing away and you're you're teeing me up with web simpson sorry i'm i'm putting the finishing touches on our recap um but yeah it was at the players championship last year that he kind of returned from that neck injury uh i think it was like a lot worse than he put off uh, to tell you the truth or the florida swing in general so Six under, kind of just a mediocre stretch of golf for the vast majority of this tournament, and then caught fire. And like you said, he's a past players championship uh, championship winner. But before this week, it was really bad. I mean, T74 at the Honda, 57th at Phoenix, a couple missed cuts before that. And so this really did come come out of nowhere for Webb Simpson. And I don't know if he can still compete with – big dogs so to speak but i mean he gained 2.6 on approach and three and a half putting today uh and for the week was fourth on approach so if he can keep that going obviously i i mean he's done it before there's a potential for him to contend at the players but i'm not sure if he can you know carry this parlay this into a good start next week just with how many good guys how many players are playing so well fun facts about webb simpson doesn't carry a six iron Probably the only guy on tour doesn't carry a six iron. But you're the you're the only guy in the world that knows that. <laughs> yeah, Paul Tesori doesn't even know that. Besides Tesori, so yeah, that was going to be like my fault. Here. <laughs> How about a hard seven? <laughs> yeah, yeah, tough number. Um, that's the early kind of wave on this Sunday, and then we transition to the chaos that ensued, Greg, and it was immediate from the initial chase pack the guys within three four maybe even five shots of Kurt Kitayama's lead and it was one Jordan Spieth who goes out and birdies four of his first five including a chip in for birdie on number five to to complete that run and before you know it Spieth has vaulted himself into a tie for the lead which was Kind of cool to watch. Spieth gets off to that hot start, and many of these other guys got off to some slow starts, uh, which I know we'll talk about chronologically. But um, this round for Jordan Spieth was a tale of two sides, especially on the greens. Um, And just uh, looking at a couple of the notes that I have here on the makes and the misses, uh, he makes an 18, nearly a 19-footer on number one, a 35-footer at number three, uh, a nice 10-footer at number four, uh, an eight footer, uh, at, at number six, um, a 13 footer at number 13. It was in, in the, uh, first 13 holes, he had five makes outside of eight feet and in holes 14 through 17, he had four misses inside of eight feet. So it was a roller coaster ride again, unfortunately it ended a, a way. I, I think Jordan probably leaves feeling like he gave this one away. Yeah, that Jordan Spieth second nine KP uh, bogeys on 14, 15, 17. The putts did not drop for him. He ends up finishing at seven under in a tie for fourth. But this was all week long. We talked about it Thursday night. He was 30 to one Thursday night. Uh, He was 25 to one to start this round on Sunday. This was full on Jordan Spieth experience. Yeah, I'm shocked that he plays well at the the tour stop at the roller coasters. <laughs> Good one. Uh, I mean, it was it was everything you wanted it to be, right? It was just, I mean, his his left miss off the tee is a disaster. It's my left. I hit them 199 <laughs> yards to the boundary fence. I like they are so they are off the planet. 
But then on, but then he'll hit a shot like he did on. Um, was it ten from the from the when he when he hits the he pulls one at that. Uh, and not pulls. He like hits one right at the pin on ten, like right over the front edge. I think it was. Yeah, and you're seven, like that is like seven feet. That's a filthy shot. So it's just, it's the whole spectrum, and that's why it's the best experience in golf. Um, you know, he he uh, he said afterwards, he was like, I felt this coming, which is not. It's not a crazy thing to say. He'd been hitting the ball well. We talked about that on, I think, on Thursday, Rick. But he, yeah. I think he was actually talking about his putting and uh, you're like, he said something like the numbers haven't really told the story of how well I've been putting, which I get a little concerned about a statement like that. When I watch him hit a putt that he thinks is missing by foot and it actually goes in. Uh, so I don't know that he's to be trusted when it comes to talking about his putting, but it, it did it, numbers wise. It was better this week. And you know, he, he, I don't know if we can ever say like Spieth should have won the, the tournament, especially with some of the stuff he was doing on the front nine, but he was kind of in control of the tournament in as much as Spieth is con- in control of anything on the back nine. And then he, you know, has a bunch of uh, like two putts from eight feet or whatever. So I, I think there's a, at least a little bit of juice for Augusta now, right? I don't know that there was much of that coming into this week. And now you could at least, and I surely will, talk yourself into him winning the Masters this year. Uh, currently 20-1 to 1 to win the Masters. That, that left miss will really work there. Uh. Just play 10 18 times and he'll be good. <laughs> uh, P- Patrick, I want you to take a look at this because uh, Josh actually tweeted this out yesterday. Do we have this tweet? Okay. These are... The two, because I I agree with this sentiment. He looks so uncomfortable while he is putting currently, and compared to the Masters eight years ago, where he he looks like he was born with a flat stick in his in his hand. Like this looks so uncomfortable to me. And to Kyle's point, he is up and out of nearly every single putt, no matter if they go in or not. It's almost like uh, Michelle Wee tabletop. Yes, it, it's getting to that point. We're I have there. that. I have that picture. I pulled that picture and forgot to tweet it out today, Patrick. Okay. Well, great minds. Yeah. Uh, it, it is but, like that. Yeah. It like when I first saw it, I, I wasn't really sure what he was doing. Um, and they, they kind of circle his head a lot on the broadcast and his head, well, his head moves a lot when he's putting and I'm no like putting expert, but I'm pretty sure that's not good. Uh, you, you should probably stay level. So maybe it's an attempt to kind of fend off his head moving so much and provide a bit of a more stable base because he looks a lot wider as well. Uh, but the technical stuff, I feel like, Greg, you probably have a better understanding of this than I do. This is definitely um, – oh, there, there are clear differences here. Uh, there's a, a lot more knee flex, obviously, a lot more elbow flex as a result. Uh, but the thing that I noticed is his, his hands seem to be a lot farther behind the ball. Uh, and he does forward press, but it doesn't even get ahead of the ball. So I would love to see, and and I was um, hoping to go and look for a 2015 face-on view of Jordan's putting stroke, because I, I believe he had a lot more forward shaft lean. And one thing that I've been noticing, it didn't happen quite as much this week. Uh, and I, I think that's because the speeds of the greens were so fast. But in weeks previous, Jordan just can't get the ball to the hole. He's been coming up short all day. Uh, and, and I think that has a lot to do with it. So there's definitely some, uh, some things going on with this setup position. It's hard to know if they're intentional or not. Uh, but something like um, a ball position or his hands getting a little bit behind the ball instead of in front of the ball the forward press not carrying all the way in front of the ball, the way that it used to, uh, at least as the way I remember. Um, those are those are kind of details that are typically missed. Uh, adding knee flex, adding a little waistband it isn't necessarily the end of the world. Um, I mean, you, if you watch Jason Day putt, he's got some waistband in there. Uh, there have been a, a number of players who have putted really well with you know a position somewhat similar to what you see there with Jordan on the right but uh the shaft lane to me is definitely a concern I think the thing that concerns me Rick is what do we hear Spieth talk about all the time um 
be an athlete. I'm the, I'm, I'm at my best when I'm not thinking I'm just being an athlete. And this is about the least athletic looking thing that he's ever done. <laughs> and I don't even mean that from like a visual, but even just from like, a, are, are you, you know, Rory talked about this with fat with Brad Faxon a couple of years ago about how it was so much like, get the hell out of your head technically and just like make putts or not even make putts, just hit good putts. And it feels like Spieth is, you know, he's like John Nash out there trying to like solve these, you know, just complex arithmetic formulas from like nine feet. And it's like, bro, just hit a nine foot putt. I, I don't know, 10 foot putt. And maybe it'll hit the hole. It just, that part of it, if, if that's your ethos is to be like the nerdy technical golf guy, which I think there was a little bit of tiger in there then great. I don't think that's his ethos. So I don't think that's when he's at his best. And I think that's the part that's concerning. Two under 70, two shots off Kurt Kitayama's eventual winning number for Jordan Spieth. He's an agent of chaos. He kicks off the chaos, but he certainly didn't end it. Patrick Cantlay posts a 68, flies up the board, but Terrell Hatton, anytime you can get Terrell Hatton, Patrick, and Jordan Spieth in the mix late on a Sunday when things are going sideways, you got to take advantage of that. Hatton goes out in 34, makes three bogeys, only one birdie coming in and will not add another red cardigan to the closet. Yeah, so one more thing on Spieth. Sorry. Um, after he no, gained no, the lead don't, don't on, be sorry. on, on I 13. Gave you the, I gave you the greatest lead into yeah. Terrell Hatton. And I'll get one there. More I'll get there. Jordan I'll get there. <laughs> after he took the lead, I think he got to 10 under on 13. He lost three strokes putting uh, over his last five holes. So That's bad. Yeah, that's Obviously. really bad. Uh, and then Hatton, the same kind of thing. The, the putter really let him down late. You think about yeah, three putt on um, par five. I believe it's 12. And then he missed a, another putt on 13 that could have easily uh, gone in. And 17, that was a par putt inside eight, uh, eight feet, I believe. So those three uh, putts are kind of what he's going to be. I, I don't know how he punishes himself. If he <laughs> kind of hits hits the putter against his head, I feel like that's what he could be into. Uh, but he he looked like early on, it, it really felt like it was going to be him or Spieth. To win it and then when Kitayama fell apart you're like all right you know Hatton somehow is gonna come away with this but the putter fell apart at the end and the iron play was great he gained over a stroke and a half with his irons today uh but short game putting end of the day everyone's gonna miss these greens with how firm and fast they are and, and it really let him down Kyle if you're gonna mess with your mic at least mute yourself we can a, hear all of that it's a disaster you just mute yourself then mess with it there we lot. go He's have lost the mic. Now He's he can now mic. he can have at it. Jeez. Woof. Um, all right. So as all of this is happening, the final pairing, Greg, that's that's Kitayama. It's Victor Hovland. I'm unfortunately gonna have to say uh Victor went out and shot a 75, dropped eight spots, finished T10. He got smacked in the face right out of the gate on number one, but one and two were playing hard, made a made a bogey on one, a double on eight, got them right back. At 10 and 11, birdies there. Uh, the big mistake coming in for Victor was uh, essentially laying the sod over it on 16 with a nine iron from the middle of the fairway. That's a, a par five. He had 100 and I think it was 80 yards in. That it, that was his chance to put a little pressure on. That was his chance to um, you know make a move. Was not able to take advantage of it. Yeah, 16, um, it was 178. He 17. tried to hit a nine iron. The, you know, the thing, it's not a 178 yard nine iron. And I wonder if that gets in your head a little bit. I mean, you're trying to hit it to the front of the green. I mean, Kyle was talking a little about the golf course earlier. And when I watch Bay Hill, I just see so much chipping from the back edge of the green. You know, it, it, we're just, we're chipping from the back of the green constantly. Uh, and then there's a lot of short putts that are being missed. So when you're that, that means that the greens are really firm. It's hard to stop it. So you're trying to hit shots that are high and hard with a lot of spin that land on the front edge. And, and the game is, can I land it on the green and keep it on the green? So you're tempted in a lot of ways to take a little bit less club. Uh, and, and that obviously wasn't one he felt very comfortable with. And it was rather disappointing. So making six there feels like another double feels like the double at eight. And then by the time you get to 18, 
I mean, he still he could have hold it from the fairway, and and uh, if he hold it from the fairway, he would have gotten to eight under, and you know, who at that point you're thinking maybe there's a playoff. So look, he held on strong, but it's it's definitely a, a disappointing day. The, the good news for Victor Kyle is this this trend line that we have going right now. He's he has not been happy about the state of his swing for the last couple of months. He's working with a new instructor. They're getting it figured out and it's bearing out in the stats here. So he gains two and a half strokes ball striking at Pebble Beach. That's only two measured rounds. He gains five in Phoenix, six at Riviera and nine and a half here this week. Now goes to TPC Sawgrass where last year he led the field and gained 14 strokes ball striking, three more than anybody else in the field last year. So we are, I think if you ask him, he's, he's obviously not going to be happy about the result, but the state of his swing seems to be getting tighter. Yeah, it does. And it, it, it reminds, by the way, somebody in the chat said I needed to get the power tools out. I need to call Cantlay and get some DeWalt stuff over here. <laughs> the American psycho. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It reminds, I mean, you know, Phoenix, we're, we're there in Phoenix and he's on the back of the range, just grind. I mean, just like deep in the process. And I thought it was funny, you know, on Saturday, he, uh, uh, Damon Hacks interviewing him on NBC or golf channel or whatever. And, uh, he's like, you know, I, I've got the squeeze cut going again and I'm hitting the right window. And I was, I was thinking like, what if somebody from, they just watched full swing, like just finished it, just tuned in. And this Norwegian guy's talking about a squeeze cut. And they're like, I, I, I might be out on this, this sport. <laughs> it seems weird. <laughs> like he's, he's hitting the ball. I mean, the, the statistical profile this week. And I think we, we saw this in a lot of ways was, was classic Hovland. It was great from Tita green, bat around the greens, uh, contends to, to, you know, finishes in the top 10 of a big time event. Like that's just kind of what he's been over the course of his career. And uh, I'm fascinated with him at TPC Sawgrass, you know, TPC Sawgrass is we've seen kind of like three or four guys thrive so far this year. It's been Rom, Homa, Scheffler, uh, kind of Rory, not really, but like three and a half of those guys have been just eating up everything. Right. And TPC Sawgrass brings so many, so many people into the mix. It, it there's so many variables there, and and you just see so many different winners. But Hovland's been awesome there. Like I think he, I think he shot like 68 back in 2020 in the first round when they canceled it. Remember That's that? Right. Yeah. Um, he's been really good there, and I think he's kind of a low key fun pick for for next week. Anybody remember who led after round one in 2020? Hideki. 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 The winner. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I guess all of you remember that. Um, yeah. <laughs> while while all this is happening, Patrick, and it's like, oh my God, Jordan Spieth's gonna do it, and here comes Terrell Hatton, and we've got like Kurt Kitayama trying to hang on. Harris English is like ready to spoil the party for everyone here. L look at the. Do we have the English scorecard? It's Beautiful. it's not very sexy. It's a birdie on fourteen. A birdie on 16 and 16 pars it's to crazy. finish at eight under. Yeah, he, he was bogey free the entire weekend, That's which is ridiculous. Wild. That's wild. Yeah, it's like Francesco but, Molinari at Carnoustie. Oh, what a pool. Uh, I, I was going to, I thought he was on the Faldo route with 18 pars. Yeah. Uh, there for a little bit. But it, it's good to see Harris English back. And I know you guys talked about the new, uh, changes to the designated events but you think about you know potentially next year harris english could have been a guy potentially on the outside looking in if this downward trajectory kept on going if you think about it's what top 50 in the fedex cup or top 30 in owgr we'll get in so this is a guy who two years ago won twice on the pga tour uh, i believe he was nominated for player of the year that year uh contended at the u.s open was a member of the u.s Ryder cup team and then obviously had the torn labrum in the hip and really has not recovered ever since that surgery. He had a top 10 at the Fortinet, but outside that the ball striking in particular off the tee has been horrendous. And then you get him back on the East coast and all of a sudden the, the Georgia Bulldogs home. And so it was good to see him kind of poke his head and have a legitimate chance to win. Uh, I mean, his putt on 18 was only 18 feet, I think. Yeah. Uh, so that easily could have gone down. I thought it was going to be, uh, a first in wins 
situation between him and Rory, to tell you the truth. Uh, but it, it just didn't go down. But it's good to see him back, and you know, hopefully it's a stepping stone to the player he used to be. Yeah, there was a there was a chance we got a four way playoff or a three way playoff, and Harris English was involved in it. So there there was a lot of scenarios in which he gets a crack to to win this golf tournament. If you think all this is fun, we're not even close to done. Greg Scotty Scheffler, Scotty Scheffler lurking in the mix, trying to win number two of title defenses this year, going two for two. He finishes at seven under, but we were he makes bogey on eighteen. We were talking about this. We were just texting about this. Literally another week where if Scotty Scheffler gains two strokes putting, he wins the golf tournament. It happens constantly. Uh, he ends up second in the field, strokes gained T to green, gains over 10 strokes. He's just a, a phenomenal ball striker. Now, today wasn't his best day uh, ball striking. He, he lost uh, with his iron play, lost almost a full shot, um, but still finished 17th for the entire week. Uh, but he he lost a you know a shot in three quarters on the putting green, one point seven seven shots uh, just putting. He was sixty fourth uh, in strokes game putting today, which is uh, which is disappointing. Um, and that's the kind of thing that Scotty needs in order to win. Uh, he doesn't need it to contend, like we talked about last night, Rick. But he needs it to win. Um, and and the other thing is he's one of the guys like Rory. Um, we were talking about when we spoke about Jordan Spieth, where he got off to that slow start and you make two bogeys in the first three holes and it's, it's understandable and you're still in the mix, but that kind of thing can just be deflating. So all of a sudden you forget about Scotty a little bit again, just like we did on Saturday. Uh, but then, then he shows up after making birdie at 12 uh, and another birdie at 16 and all of a sudden Scotty's name shows up on the lower right hand corner <laughs> where, you know, they have the top five and you say, Oh, gee, here we go again. Scotty's going to win. He's going to pick this thing off. And, and, and the shot into 18 was so close to being so good. And uh, we really could have had a, a playoff and who knows if he makes birdie there, what happens to, uh, to Kitty Yama on 18. It, I mean, that could change a lot of things, but, it really felt like Scotty was going to steal one uh, despite the putting struggles. And it unfortunately didn't happen for him. If you have one of those plasma TV, Scotty Scheffler's name is burnt into the lower right-hand corner of your <laughs> television. Yeah. If you think all that was interesting, how about Rory McElroy? I've heard of him, Kyle. Uh, so we were, we were watching golf. Ar Armina had Rory McElroy in, uh, in one and done. OK, and Kurt Kitayama, I think, was at 10 under par. Rory was six back and it was right at nine. He had a birdie putt on nine. And I said, ah, don't give up hope. I said, you know what? I think if Rory makes this, he might have a chance. He makes it on nine. He makes another on 10, another on 12, another on 13. And then disaster strikes squares on 14 and 15. He gets one back at 16. But. A close but no cigar situation for Roars. Yeah, if you gave me this card and just said whose card was this, <laughs> who do you think I would have said? Jordan Speed. Yeah, yeah. Five bars. Yeah, it was extraordinary. Um, real quick, while I'm thinking about it, I was just looking at the numbers. Emiliano Grillo finished first tee to green and last in putting, which is not crazy for him, but I always love it when you get like such an extreme – He's yeah. He, he's the uh, you asked the other day who's like the king of team no putt like he is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Rory thing's interesting because he is so the no lineup guys have uh, have denoted John Rahm as the buoy, and I think I think Rory's the buoy of Bay Hill because you know after I mean seventy three on Thursday and Rom's at sixty five and you're like oh okay like that's this isn't happening and then he just sixty eight sixty nine seventy and he's in it the the thing that was interesting on Sunday and and I don't know I didn't I was there was a lot going on at the very end as Patrick knows but um he said that he didn't know he was leading on fourteen. And so he hit what, – what, I got to look up. What happened on 14? So 14 he, is the par three, three. Where, yeah. where he hits it into the front 
left bunker, and it was kind of not was, up against the lip, but it was it was awkward. That was where he slipped on the on the tee shot. Yes, correct. Yeah, and he hits that big hook, and it just doesn't stop hooking. Now he said he would have hit a different shot there. I I don't know. I I think he was trying to make a two there, and maybe if he knows he's leading, he just tries to make a three because he knows. Mm. Okay, I can extend the lead at sixteen. Basically, I can just play the rest of the holes in one under or try to play them in one under and get to the house. At, what would that have been? Uh, it, it would have been. Well, it would have been two shots better. Oh, well, if he plays it, if he plays it one under from 14. Yeah. Uh, ele- no, because he would be he would have been three shots better. Two shots better. It. So he would have been at 10 under. He would have won. He was at nine under, right? He played him one over. And if he plays him, one he under. played him at one over. That is correct. So that if is, he goes, that is how if, math works. If he, <laughs> num- numbers guy, Rick, <laughs> if he goes par, par, birdie, par, par, like that, I think that's what he would have tried to do instead of going at that left pin on 14. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I would love to, you know, you hear guys talk all the time about just the psychology of looking at leaderboards or not looking at leaderboards or whatever. And, uh, I don't know. That that would be an interesting thing to kind of like dive deeper on. But, I, you know, a little bit the same thing for Rory as I feel about speed. He's got a little juice now. You know, he had a bad for him start to the year with Phoenix. And I mean, on the PGA Tour, I know he won in Dubai, but Phoenix and Riv are just kind of like whatever, didn't really do a ton. So he's got some juice going to the players where he's won, going to the Masters where he, he is, you know, needs to win. Um, so I think. All in all, especially with the 73 on Thursday, it was a pretty, pretty good week for, uh, for Rory, especially the way he closed it out. T2 for Rory. Uh, eight under par, tied with Harris English. The winner of the Arnold Palmer Invitational. 200 to 1, 250 to 1, depending on where you were looking. Kurt Kitayama, Patrick, you alluded to this a little bit. The resilience of Kitayama. Uh, go back to Saturday, right? I mean, he did on Saturday what the 250 to one guy does on Saturday. He goes out in three over after sleeping on the lead, and you're supposed to never see him again. He's yeah. supposed to be gone from the coverage. He is supposed to eject not so fast. He plays his second nine on Saturday in 33, three under par. And again, Makes a triple Patrick on nine today on Sunday. Should have been see you later. Get that final group out of coverage. We're never going to see you again. Uh, hangs tough, makes a birdie on 17. We have that, but we'll show it in a second. And just the absolute resilience to win this golf tournament. He really should have tried to play that one on nine left handed, you know, all of Spieth from. Well, like, I think he was trying to, but there was, it wasn't, yeah, that was, it was definitely OB, but he, he was like, Oh, I could, what I thought was most interesting about that is that he was two inches away from his ball. It was OB and he just left it there. Like, why didn't he just pick it up? Why, why, he, doesn't, he doesn't even want that ball anymore. They're free. I don't need them. <laughs> you know. uh, but his swing on number, number four gave him trouble today as well. Uh, he, he took wood off the tee and, you know, going back to Saturday, that, that swing really reminded me of Mito Pereira's on the 72nd hole well, at Southern Hills. It looks like he's – it looks – Patrick, we, we all played baseball. It looks like he's rolling over – rolling a ball over to the third baseman. Like Scott Rowland would have made a billion dollars on Kurt Kitayama. <laughs> Scott Rowland. There is no <laughs> other planet you get a Kurt Kitayama Scott Rowland comp. No, there's not. Pod. I had a I had a Dion Waiters Victor Hovland today or yesterday. I saw. Wow, that, that was pretty good. S- speaking of cross sport comps, so he goes by Quadzilla or the Quadfather, <laughs> and, per Xander. Uh, I guess they play together in Vegas, and I had AJ Dillon in my mentions, like with the you know, kind of screaming, smiling emoji. And then I had Packer fans in my DMs. Whoa. They're like, there's only one Quadzilla. It's oh, AJ boy. Dillon. Who the, who the hell is this guy? Wait, was AJ like, Dillon was uh, like in your, in your dish about this. And he, he like replied with a few emojis. I don't, I didn't, even, quote. I didn't even know that was his, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I was looking up AJ Dillon's quads. I mean, those are freaking huge. Like, probably bigger than me uh 
But back to Kurt Kitayama. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see uh, Joseph Amanya said that if he would have made an eight on nine, he would have it would have been the true quad father situation. <laughs> <laughs> Really earned the name there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so good. <laughs> that is real good. Uh, but yeah, today today on four, he took less than driver, which obviously got got him into trouble on Saturday, and he just smothered it left. Uh, he just didn't want anything to do with it. Ended up making bogey. Uh, but I've read something from Skyhook, some putting stats from him on Twitter, and I guess Kitayama is one of the best putters outside of 30 feet on tour. And so you saw that uh, with the putt on three. You saw it again on the par three as well on the front nine. I think he made, a, what, a 45-footer and a 35-footer for a couple of his birdies on the front uh, and then kind of just held steady uh, there going on the outward nine or inward nine. And he, he told Damon Hack after the round that he talked to Tim Tucker from nine to ten, and he was like, I feel fine. Like, I don't feel like I'm choking this away. And he's like, yeah, just keep your head down, keep trucking. And – he made seven pars in a row and it was enough for him to be back on the top of the leaderboard and oh, go ahead. Here's, here's the tweet. Uh, Josh, can you share my screen? I have it. I have it loaded in there. So here's the tweet. So Patrick says, okay, yeah, the quote from Xander, <laughs> we call him quadzilla. AJ Dillon replies with this emoji, right? Like the, uh, I'm not so sure about that. Right. Is that the, is that like the way you'd use that? Yeah. Um, which first off, you didn't tag him. Does he search quadzilla? Does he For like, sure. does he, he doesn't even search I his own so. name. He just searches quadzilla. You, you should look at my, uh, my quote tweet of that. Okay. I, th on. I thought it was a banger. All right. <laughs> so then people say he cannot have that nickname. It's taken. People this is my favorite <laughs> one. A golfer. That group is sad with nicknames. People, <laughs> People definitely take uh, the 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 seriousness with with which people take stuff on Twitter is like <laughs> that's pretty good. The serious, I, I I jokingly did the upgrade uh, tweet the meme on Rom to <laughs> Tiger to Rom on Thursday. I still have people in my mentions like you did this. This is your fault, and I'm like, listen, I I don't. Like, the, I don't know what to tell you. you know, I, I mean, you know I'm an gets, idiot on the internet. You know what gets a lot of comments is uh, when you tweet out Tiger handing JT a tampon. Oh, my gosh. Dude, I told – I we were texting about that. <laughs> and I was like – I was like, dude, that's going to – this is going to be insane. It was. How, you, how, many, are, how many impressions you get from that one? A couple milli? Uh, last I time like I checked, 20. I had to mute it. It was insane. It was like 25 million. Yeah. Wow. It, it was, it was, it was insane. You set the world on fire. People, the internet, <laughs> That's viral. Twitter is nuts. Yeah. You're probably, people are probably still in your mentions about it. Probably. Yeah. I'd have to unmute it, but like, yes, probably. Can you, you can mute a single tweet. Yeah. Oh, oh. boy. I'm going to just <laughs> wear that feature out. Kyle tomorrow mornings, just all live stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, Kyle earned about two mutes, two mute key mute buttons yeah. tonight. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, Greg. I just, I don't know, man. Like, I, I was so impressed with with Kitayama this weekend. I, I mean, it's one thing to recover from a seven with nine holes left, but when you've got Rory, Hovland, Hatton, Spieth, Cantlay, Scheffler coming around the coming around the bend. And you're trying to win for the first time in the PGA Tour, and you play the last nine and one under. That's 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 pretty impressive, you know. And and uh, he's not a he's not a nobody. He was forty whatever, forty seven in the world coming in. I didn't realize this, Rick. I, I actually went to look this up because I was going to make the point that you know this time next year, Kurt Kitayama wouldn't even be in the field if he if he because um, I thought he was outside the top fifty in the. Uh, FedEx Cup last year, but he finished like 38th in the FedEx Cup. He yeah, gets the I mean, most out of his starts, his yes, good ones. Yeah. yeah. He he Greg, Greg, you you talked about this a little bit earlier in the week. It's it's that it's that 80-20 rule or the 20-80 rule. Yes. And then also you you had kind of mentioned this. Like he even though those runner-up finishes, he hasn't really backed down. He hasn't like lost anything. He's a pretty gritty 
guy. And then to hear the quote from uh, from Kyle there just saying, like, you know, between nine and ten, it's like, or maybe with Patrick who said it, just like, I'm, I'm not choking this away. Like, I, I feel fine. It's pretty cool. It's really cool. I mean, there's a couple things about him that I find really interesting. We said yet last night he's the ultimate popper. And I, I was looking through the PGA Tour website and his – How'd that go in for his, you? In his career, you know, it was pretty good. Um, five, five PGA Tour top threes, uh, five PGA Tour top tens, unless I was missing something. So all of his, all of his top tens are top threes. Yeah, on the PGA Tour, which is incredible to me. Um, and then there's 25 missed cuts in his PGA Tour career as well. So this is a boomer bust kind of guy, and. To me, he got a couple of things kind of dialed in this week that he hasn't all year. Um, it, you saw the inconsistency in this performance because while he uh, hits two shots OB, makes two sevens on the weekend uh, and is able to win, I mean, he he still he led the field or was tied first in driving accuracy. And he was one of only three players to hit 50 greens, which at Bay Hill, that's kind of a – a really important mark. If you can hit 50 greens, you're going to be right up there near the top. And now uh, five winners in a row have been top 10 in greens of regulation for the week. So it's a, a really important thing. But with Kitayama, he's 103rd on tour entering the week in greens of regulation, leads the field this week. Driving accuracy, 195th on the PGA Tour, leads the field this week. Uh, putting, he's 129th in strokes game putting, second for the week in in strokes game putting. So uh, he made a lot of really big jumps, and, and he does that periodically throughout his career. It's just it's cool that he did this in a uh, in a designated event. I think real quick on the designated event part of that, Patrick is you know I know the I, I, we were talking about this maybe on Thursday, Rick, but. I know the I know the event, the fields are not that much different than last year. They're they're I mean they're not demonstrably different in terms of the quality of players in the field, but just the just the fact that they've marked them uh, like these are the important ones. I, I I think for somebody like Kitayama who like if this was Bay Hill say two years ago, I think you could look at a at a Kitayama win and say, well, I don't know, like some of the stars weren't there. It's a it's a good win. You can't. There's nowhere to hide now. Like you can't hide. You can't write off wins like this now. And I think just providing that context is a really meaningful thing. Like I think I, I think that that is actually a very important thing for the future of the tour and for fans is like, no, this was one of the 13 best wins of the year, like just period full stop, because otherwise you could kind of just like hide it at the end of the year. And, uh, and now you can't. And I think that's, I think that's meaningful. And I think it's important. I think Max Homa said <clears throat> at the beginning of the week that he was talking to some player who was in the haunted classic and the player was like, you know, it's just nice every once in a while knowing John Rom's not in the field. <laughs> uh, so to your point it's like this guy took down Scheffler, Rom, McElroy and you have that benchmark of these events are going to be this high and no matter how good uh you know uh 3M open might be down the stretch with say three or four top tier players playing that and they all contend this this wins better like the numbers right there to back it up with 44 of the top 50 in the world uh, and for someone like Kitayama to do it, I mean, this is what makes sports great. It, it's cool to see the Titans battle it out every now and again, but I love seeing the little guy win. And he, I mean, he's only five seven, but and it, the quads, it's though. It, quad, yeah, quadzilla. And it, it's what makes sports great. It's why you want to watch it because the majority of the time, Roy McRoy, Scotty Scheffler, John Rahm, they're going to beat the Nick Taylors and the Kurt Kitayamas and the Keith Mitchells of the world. But when they don't, it just makes it that much better. The birdie on 17. Do we have that video? Let's run it. Kurt Kitayama right in the center of the cup with some pace. Dead in the heart. We kind of talked about it a little bit, Greg. The coming up 18, he misses the fairway left. Missing the fairway left is a lot better than missing it right, but it's still no, no piece of cake. He 
muscles up in, uh, I think it was an eight iron to the middle of the green. He's got two putts to get it down from there. And I was a little bit worried because he took so much time. He read that putt every angle three times each. And I mean, that's one of the rare putts in the game of golf that uh, any one of us can tell you what it's going to do. Like everybody knows what that putt does. You just, you, you don't even have to have played Bay Hill. You know what it does. Uh, and so you see, but I, I certainly understand it, but that was, that was three putt territory, I would say. Uh, and boy, uh, he made a great stroke despite how much time he took. And I'll tell you one other thing that that second shot in there, even, even when you play left and you have a one shot, lead, it's really narrow over there. Yeah. You know, those bunkers are not fun and landing short and rolling it up the way you have to uh, coming out of the rough. It, it really narrows that area because you, you can't miss right at that point. If you're going to fly it past the flag, you, you have a little bit more room to the right. It gets wider. Um, but that, that's why hitting that fairway is so important. And it was a uh, kind of a, a gutsy shot to, to pull that off. That, how about how gutsy the, uh, the, the Scheffler shot was like two, two groups earlier. That was the Victor shot from last year. <laughs> yeah. Victor. That's why I compared him to Dion Whiters. He's never seen a shot. He, he wasn't going to take. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing uh real quick on the the uh, kitayama 18 him marking the ball yeah. from like one millimeter is <laughs> i mean this how is, good is that this is what happens actually... if you take like a deep breath by accident and knock it in? yeah this I... is actually the riskier thing to do like i you you are have a better chance of screwing up marking this yeah. than than tapping it in yeah so it's it's a very saucy, very very saucy move. I don't. I was trying to decide between that or Rory having to take his watch off to go play the playoff. Which one would be a so, like a more tour sauce thing? I think it's probably this. But Rory putting his watch on and then having to take it off to go win a tournament would be pretty hilarious. Also, uh, so I got my first like real taste of F one this morning. Oh, Ooh. yeah, B- bad day for Ferrari. And yeah. what how, did they nobody completed or what? Uh, Leclerc's engine failed. Sorry, oh. Rick, go ahead. So, <laughs> speaking of Rolex, so I love the way F1 does everything commercial free, but they sell literally every square inch of everything. So, Lewis Hamilton's gloves have a fake like Rolex on them, so it looks like he's wearing a Rolex on his. Could you imagine a golfer who's got a Rolex sponsorship who gets a little bit longer glove? And it looks like he's wearing a Rolex while he's playing. Hey, you, Rick, you know, you know what I would uh, love is for everything on the broadcast to be sponsored so that we didn't have commercials. Me too, bud. I'm working on it. I mean, that's, that's the whole, that's the deal, right? Yeah. Like, that's what, that's essentially what you're saying. Yes. I'm saying I watched an entire hour of the pregame show and the 90 minutes of the race without a commercial because every square inch is sold. And I would love that. Yeah. I mean, you want to take the, to do the, do, I mean, I'm sure Greller will get involved with that. Put, put stuff all over him. Yeah. I mean, whatever you want to do, do it. Um, they don't even, the PJ tour doesn't even really use like the signs like, uh, like the deep, the DP World Tour puts those signs like everywhere, yeah. at, like anywhere mm-hmm. within like thirty yards of the green. There's like they the don't cups, even do that yet. The cups should be sponsored. You yeah. could get a buoy uh, sponsor for the water, like on all these courses. Maybe I just got, Rom could sponsor them. I don't know. I've got lots of ideas that I will uh, tweet out at some point. Um, all right, we we or, I mean we still have like a ton to do. So, congratulations, Kurt Kitayama, first PGA Tour victory, three point six million dollars. You're going to be a top twenty player in the world when you wake up on Monday morning. Congratulations. Any final thoughts before we get out of API? We got to talk Puerto Rico. We have to talk James Hahn. We have to convert our. We got to talk about our best bets, our one and done. We got a lot to do. Anything else on API? Uh, um kp's take that Morikawa was a bad win player is looking better by the week that's true it's it's a i mean i saw what i saw it's true the, as an open champion that's a rare thing it was it wasn't windy though uh, yeah it's just a rare thing when you look back yeah. i i think you're right 
Here's another Mark Howitt take. Has he won in front of fans before? <laughs> no, because I tweeted that out and just got I oh, needed to you? mute I needed to mute that. <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I think he I mean, yeah, like the the open had fans, right? Yeah, some. Yes. Are you discounting his Barracuda championship win? <laughs> I would never. Yeah, That's up there right behind the Patrick open. actually wouldn't. Uh, yeah, a lot of them didn't, but I don't know. I, I don't know what to do with Morikawa. He's, he's, I'm, I'm very, I'm both like up and down on him. I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm confused by him. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Puerto Rico and much, much more, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. Puerto Rico is in the books, and it's Nico Echeverria who cashes in the victory. 21 under par, 67, 67, 65, 68. Greg, start here with you. The Colombian takes it down. He's been a professional for five years. He's out of the University of Arkansas, and he played well on the weekend, uh, obviously, to be able to get it done. He made some really nice putts today, a uh, number of them. I mean, on number six, he made a bogey. Uh, after he, he birdied number one and two coming into the day with a two shot lead, which is a great start. But when he gets to number six, he nearly hits it in the hazard and kind of makes a mess of it and made like a 20 footer for bogey, which was big. So I, I was watching the highlights. I didn't get to watch a lot of live coverage, but I watched a lot of highlights on this and uh, he must, he might've had like eight fist pumps, uh, eight yeah. butts made with fist pumps today, which was, it, it really stood out to me, but um, definitely a really nice player. He made a really nice push to get his PGA Tour card last year. And this is really only the third event he's played well in. And played well in, in Bermuda, played well at the Sony Open, um, and, and now wins, the, wins Puerto Rico. So it, it, it's a big deal. It's a career-changing victory for him, even though there may still be a curse that comes along with it. No. Mm. no. Tony Fina, Tony come broke on. It. Is it shattered? Tony broke it. Uh, yeah, cracked. Tony, we'll okay. go cracked. We'll go cracked. Right. Victor had the asterisks. Correct. Tony, Tony's mm -hmm. shattered it. You're right. The kind of pretty big story out of Puerto Rico, Kyle, is Akshay. So yeah. Ak Akshay shoots 67, 65, including a 30 on his inward nine to finish solo second. Rick, why is that so important? Well, let me tell you why. That has earned him special temporary membership on the PGA Tour. What in the world is that? Here is what it is. If you earn as many points as the guy who finished, I guess we're still doing 125 from the year prior. <laughs> who knows? What we're doing. <laughs> the year prior, you are a special temporary member. This is what Will Zalatoris did a couple of years ago. So it, he is not a member. He will not be able to, Kyle, be in the FedEx Cup playoffs unless he wins between now and then. But he is now able to take a, an unlimited number of sponsor exemptions, assuming he will be offered as many as he wants. So Akshay is going to get a lot of run on the PGA Tour the rest of the year. Yeah, he is, and he's still super young. I mean, I think he's – he was talking about being able to uh, to to legally drink afterwards. So I think I think he's twenty one. I mean, he was out there when he was nineteen. Rick, we got to we got uh, to to the tour's credit. I think they really did a good job of clarifying how you get into these designated events, right? With a hey, top fifty, or uh, you're like basically you're playing hot at the moment to get into the designated events. We got to have some clarity around like we, we can't have special temporary exemption stuff like you have to either be in or out. Um, and yeah, they're, 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 the, the, to your point, 100 percent agree. Will Zalatoris would have he let he lost out on millions of he would have been like top 10 in the FedEx Cup points when they got to the playoffs that year. Yeah. And I know it's complicated and but but so were the designated events and we just uncomplicated them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know. And and I think, I think what I'm saying it might it might um, like there might be a tension between that and like well, 
okay, the, the, the alternative is you just wait until the end of the year and Akshay's in for next year. So that's not better than him being into some events this year. I'm saying accelerate the, like make it as, as, um, frictionless as possible to get your young players and young stars that are playing well into some of these lower tier events. Yeah. Throw them in the deep end. Just let him play. You know, he's 21 years old. He's got all the energy in the world. Let him play whatever he wants. Yeah. Like he, he should be getting starts ahead of, for example, a James Hahn type. I'm not saying James Hahn personally, but a James Hahn type who is existing like the JJ Henry, like, Oh, well he's got 400. I, I don't like, I could not care less about how many stars JJ Henry has on the PGA tour. I, I want to see Akshay play in the Honda classic. Akshay finished T nine, the Honda classic finished runner up in Puerto Rico. And he's very excited to get back to Valspar Patrick, because that's where he made his professional debut. Got emotional in his uh, post round post tournament interview. Just can't believe he's a special member of the temporary member of the tour. He's got a bit of a uh, – he's, he's good on the coast. You see the Bahama finishes. I think he won there last year, and then he had back-to-back top tens uh, in January, and then uh, the approach numbers were, like, really good at the Honda Classic. So I, I love when new talent, new blood gets introduced. We saw it with Pearson Cootie uh, this week. He had a great week. Uh, Ludwig also contended, the amateur who – Uh, is number one in the PGA Tour U standings. So it was actually a big week for him to kind of extend his lead in that because you get full access or full membership uh, if you finish that. So, I mean, I I think, I think you could make a scenario where like, okay, Akshay's in this lower tier. Now somebody else is out somebody who's playing terribly, you know? Yeah. And maybe that's, unfair to like players that qualified to be on the PGA tour last year, but there, I, the, the application. And again, it was great. The application of what they did to the designated events. I, I think that needs to trickle down to your uh, non-designated and your corn fairy also. Yeah. So I've always believed that um, if you're like over the age of 75, you should probably have to retake your driver's test. Hmm. And I think they could implement something similar on the PGA tour. You know, where you, you're not able Describe to rely, <laughs> you're not able to rely on all your past accolades or if it's like a past champion or number of starts or even money list to an extent where you could get some of those younger guys in if you kick some of the old guys out. That's it's I'm workshopping it. Battle, workshopping. battle Royale, throw all those guys in a tournament and see who can play their way out of it. Like there's there's gotta be guys, Rick, that are getting starts ahead of Akshay that, that shouldn't that are not that shouldn't be, right? Yeah, like four dozen of them. Yes, there's a t- if you see the b- yes, I mean the elevated events have changed things, but go look at the bottom of the Honda Classic field. Akshay should have been in there over like thirty of those guys. Yeah, now I guess the I guess the the argument, the flip side of that is like if you top ten, like the the tour can say, well, if you finish in the top ten, you're in the next event, right? Um, so maybe they do already have some of that in place, but. Yeah, anything that's going to lean into getting the 20 and 21 year old and 22 year old that are playing really good golf into these uh, televised PGA Tour events like Honda, Valspar, etc. Do whatever you have to do. I don't. I don't care. Congratulations, Nico. Congratulations, Akshay. Not congratulations, James Hahn, who spent 45 minutes talking to Golf Week. Greg, and I'm not even really sure where to start on this. James Hahn has been very outspoken on Twitter about, um, I don't know, a lot of things, just a lot of gripes in relationship to what the PGA Tour is doing and what Liv is doing. When asked about the changes made to the 2024 PGA Tour season, Hahn said, quote, I mean, I hate them, end quote. Uh, He would then go on to say things like, he couldn't believe Tiger Woods won two straight years of a popularity contest. And if Peter Malnati is not going to stick up for the rank and file, he doesn't deserve to be there and they need people like me, but they don't want people like me. Some, some portion of that. Yeah. He uh, has a lot of takes. Um, that's for sure. And he doesn't like the idea that the rich get richer. <laughs> he does uh, have some takes. Yeah. We have, we have that in common, uh, but that's about it. Sure. That's where yeah. it ends. Yeah, it, there's there's takes. But he, he doesn't like the idea that the rich get richer. And that that is what this whole thing boils down to. 
Um, but ultimately, I think what what some of the top guys at the PGA Tour have said which is, you know, we need to develop a product that we can sell so that we can compete financially with, uh, with live golf is, you know, who, who's a new competitor in the marketplace now. So we, you know, it's not just like the money on the PGA tour is pulled out of a hat. These things have to be earned. You have to sell it to sponsors, like all those sponsorship ideas that you guys had. Well, there's a lot that goes into that one uh, can you sell all those things? Is there a sponsor willing to bid on them? And I'm sure in many cases there are, but can you get a title sponsor to sponsor an event at the same price? If there's not exclusivity, if you will, right, there's all these other sponsors mingled in there. Does that devalue the, um, the, the title sponsor? So uh, my point in saying all that is ultimately this is a business and you have to make a decision to try to get, the uh the highest potential earnings out of it it didn't used to be that way because there wasn't there wasn't competition like this and now all of a sudden you have this competition which he james has talked uh, at length about over the last couple of years and you have to respond and you have to create something that's going to be competitive and you have to try to make improvements for the guys you're afraid of losing and quite frankly nobody's afraid of losing james Hahn. Um, the, the PGA tour is not afraid of losing him. They're afraid of losing uh, Justin Thomas and Rory McIlroy, right? We all know that. So it's, um, and I'm not saying that they want to lose James Hahn. I'm not saying that they want to lose anybody. They don't, but the, the players that are, um, that they're catering to now are the, the really important players. And I just, I, I, it's very clear that James Hahn doesn't, like that avenue. He, here's my favorite quote. Uh, James Hahn describes a scenario in which when Jordan Spieth would talk to an executive in board meetings, they would start <laughs> blushing and say things like, oh my gosh, Jordan's talking to me. How awesome is this? Which Kyle, one, is exactly how I feel when Rory McIlroy talked to me. I was like, oh my God, how awesome. <laughs> and two, I think James Hahn is generally, I think James Hahn's generally an idiot. And I think that he wants his live invite and he hasn't gotten it yet. And that's fine. But this is, this is what we've talked about before, where there are five or six different uh, stakeholders in all of this and making them all happy is not going to be possible. So executives and the tour have to decide who are we going to make happy? And they are certainly opting for speed Thomas McElroy over Malnati Han everyone else i i I tried i wanted to write about this for our website it it may have just (laughs) burned it to the ground so they wouldn't let me uh i i don't i i guess i don't really know rick the speed quote was incredible and that's why i tweeted like speed's back was hurting today because he's been carrying james hahn around for the last seven years but uh what what is what is James Hahn up like actually upset about? I don't know. Like like uh, I I don't understand. I, I I guess the only thing and now listen, I'm not I'm not. I think the tour is wrong. You can quibble with this, but I I don't I don't love the small field no cut stuff. I, I don't I'm not saying that that's a great thing. Is he mad about not getting as many starts uh, next year as he did last year? Like, I, I guess I just uh, – the money's increasing. The league is stronger and better than it was. And it just seems like he I, – I don't, I don't understand what he's upset about. I think he feels the way that this reads is like a scorned ex lover. Who's I don't think he likes that his opinion wasn't taken seriously or his opinion wasn't taken and weighed as much as some of the stars. And yes, I do think what you're, I think what you're, what he's upset about Kyle is what you mentioned. I think he's worried that he's either going to lose starts or he's going to have to play 75 times. Yeah. So he has this quote in here. It says, um, And this was the one, well, every quote stood out to me. Uh, He said the solution, uh, let's see here. 
they've created these elevated events where it significantly impacts other full field events sandwiched in between. Uh, I, I don't know. That quote doesn't make sense. The solution to their problem is to limit the number of players that get into elevated events to force the other players into the other full field, non-elevated events. To me, it's a road we have to be very careful on uh, because going back to our mission and our purpose is to be able to create the best playing opportunities for our membership and be able to contribute and donate back to the communities and charities that we play in. It seems like the major theme over these last few years has been about how do we get the most money to the most popular players on tour. First of all, welcome to professional sports, James Hahn. And second of all, the the and and I actually am empathetic to this. The the goal the the PGA Tour it's it's in a it's in a weird place because it's membership run and it's a uh not it's a uh tax uh it's a non-profit right and so i think technically han is correct in saying like well the goal of the tour should be for its membership to get a ton of playing opportunities technically true uh and we uh goal of the tour is to give back to charities technically true guess what james han that's not how the real world works. Like, that's not how any of this operates. You know, like, that's why live exists. That's why we're here to begin with. So th- functionally, you have to change what your mission and your, like, what you're putting your effort toward so that you can give to charity at all. Because if not, then the league won't exist and there won't be any money to give to charity. I think that's the part that it's like, are you not understanding that? And he's like, well, those guys won't go to live anyway. That's a hell of a thing to bet your business on. We should just keep the status quo. And you're, you're betting on the opinion of players that don't really matter to your league that Rory and JT won't go to live. That sounds like a good idea to bet, bet the future of your business on. I, I just, I, I don't know, man. There's so much in here that it's like, I, I get where he's, like like sort of the the universe that he's coming from but it's like yeah that's why we're in this position to begin with you know and that's i don't know there's just a lot of that in there I think. right i i agree it sucks for him for like in his specific position but like what's the like what's the tour supposed to do here here patrick last word it on doesn't this. suck that bad though I know that. it's relative. Go, go it's all yeah. relative, right? The guy's made like twelve million dollars playing golf. Prof- like, Sad. It's, it doesn't suck, but like relatively speaking. But here's so here's uh, he tweeted out this. I think this is from this morning. It says morning thoughts on the new structure of the PGA Tour, and here's the quote: With so much on the line these days, top seventy making the playoffs, exemptions, and elevated events, it gives the quote top players more opportunities to stay on top. We have basically given them eight more tournaments with guaranteed money and points by taking away an taking away from average players. If I play 28 events a year, it doesn't seem likely I will be playing 28 events next year, given the same status and especially not with the same amount of points. Example, uh, i.e. opposite field events. If a top player falls behind, he can add more events to his schedule to earn more points. The rich get richer, end quote. Yeah, so so my thing about this is, they, they mentioned in that Golf Week article, or uh, Rory talked about it, about the churn rate. From going, yeah. you know, they ran the numbers. They ran the numbers. The guys at PGA Tour had they ran through RickRunGood.com, probably. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Numbies, so, yep, that's right. Some mixed condition models, uh, and it went from I think eighty percent, which they felt was way too high, down to sixty percent. Yeah, eighty uh, percent was their original kind of proposal back at the Delaware delegation in yeah, September. T- t- TM to catch your uh, name. <laughs> you really, and it's down to sixty, which will kind of you know move these the 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 weight along or uh so my thing about this is and it, it goes back to harris english about a top player is he was a top player he was a i think borderline top 10 player in the world a couple years ago and like i said nominated for player of the year twice a winner all these accolades and he is the prime example of a top player Yes, it has has to do with injury, but he did lose his game a little bit. And he's not a Ricky Fowler type who's going to get one of the four sponsors exemptions. Where Shoot he's, the sponsor he, exemptions into the sun, by the way. That's garbage. He's, he's going to have to play himself back into these tournaments. So that just kind of ruins James Hahn's article if you use Harris English as the use case. In, in what way, Patrick? He was a top player, top 10 in the world. I think he, I think he reached as high as 10. I could be wrong about that. And he just absolutely fell off the face of the map where 
say if that continued, say he doesn't get the world ranking points and something like that continued going into the next month or so. And he drops out of, I think you have to be top 30 in the official world golf rankings and top 50 in the FedEx cup to get into these events next yeah. year. He could easily be out of those. And I will say that does leave a door open for Liv to pick off some of these guys. If, if we're being honest about the whole ecosystem where it's, Oh, I could fight my way through the Honda classic, through the Vallis bar, these tournaments I've never played before and never have wanted to travel to, or I could take a payday from live and, and play 14 events a year. I will say, I think that's the one downside that maybe the PGA tour didn't think about is these guys who do lose their game. They're going to be lives prime targets and you're forcing them to play in events. They might not want to. Yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. But at the same time, you have guys like, you know, um, Chris Kirk, who just won the Honda Classic and skipped a designated event because he thought he would do better at the Honda Classic um, and ends up winning. And it's a, a monumental moment in his career. So, I mean, these non-designated events are not nothing tournaments, right? They're, they still they offer 500 FedEx Cup points. The designated events offer 550 for the winner. They are, it's a minor uh, in, in comparison. And, and, and you could make the argument, if you're James Hahn, if you get, quote unquote, relegated to the non-designated events, you have a better chance of getting in the top 50 the next year. Um, it's probably not better, but you have a, an opportunity to play week in and week out as somebody like Harris English against not John Rom, against not Scotty Scheffler, against not Justin Thomas, because all those guys are playing together. So yeah. They're not mixed up anymore. You get the guys who are kind of your peers at the moment. Now we see this all like Michael Kim, all of a sudden in, in Puerto Rico finishes top five. He's a great player, but he's, he's not going to finish top five in a designated event. We know that. Uh, but all of a sudden, he could play his way into a, a designated event playing in, um, you know, some of the smaller fields. So I, I just I think it's full of opportunity for these guys. And uh, James um, doesn't want to see it that way. I think the the, the um, argument that you're making, Greg, is dependent on how many FedEx Cup points they allocate to the. Might uh, that change? Is that going to change? It is going to change. That was oh, in the okay. that was in the memo that that uh, that Monahan sent to sent to the player. So that's going to be um, that's going to be pretty interesting. I, I don't. It, yeah. they, he didn't say like what the numbers were going to be, but it is going to be different uh, than it than it uh, it was before. I think I think that James Hahn is upset that his world got a little like more difficult right you, you can't just like uh yeah it it just got it got harder and i and i do understand what he's saying about well i thought our mission was to create a lot of opp playing opportunities for everybody because i think that is technically that is the pga tour's mission but the reality is that the PGA Tour's mission should be to create the best league imaginable, the best business imaginable. And I think the weird part about all this, and I was talking to some people on Twitter about this uh, publicly, but like it's kind of weird. It would be kind of weird if Patrick Mahomes was making up the bylaws of the NFL or Giannis was determining like how the structure of the NBA was going to be for the next 10 years. That's kind of weird, right? And the reason for it is because you have a membership organization that's, an, that's a nonprofit. But man, like it would, it, 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 it does. I don't like the, the stars, like you should always incentivize uh, like stars to thrive in your league. I'm not saying that correctly. There should be incentive, like you should reward stars. But it's weird when, when the stars are the ones that are arriving at that decision. And that's just the nature of like the setup of the league. And I, I don't really know that can be helped. Last thing, Rick, I could do an hour on James Hahn. I know. He said this. Uh, he was talking about the PIP. This, this is the one that just destroyed me. He said, 
uh, we, uh, we never should have gone to $100 million for the PIP to begin with. That's $50 million we just threw away on this experiment. Okay. Uh, and we knew that no one was really going to uh, go jump ship again. Good luck betting on that. You're just funneling money to this small group of people because they were demanding it. They were literally negotiating with the tour and they were saying, this is what they want or else. I don't know if that happened. I don't know if that's true. I don't know who that was. But James Hahn said they basically said, not word for word, but they basically said, we want $120 million, $120 million in the PIP or else. And we said, okay, what if we give you 100 Okay, we'll settle for 100 That's not how a business is run. That's not how an organization is run. That's not how the PGA Tour should be run. That's, that's literally how all businesses run, is negotiating. Like I, that, that one just like, I, I just read it and I was like, that's not how business is run. That's not how organization is run. Literally every business in the world runs on negotiation. Like that's just, that's just like business economics 101. And that that he would say that was just – there's there's almost like this illiteracy in terms of how uh, people view the PGA Tour. And, and, and part of that's their fault, right, the nonprofit thing. But, man, that it, – it's not, this is not – this is 21st century sports. It's big boy business. It's not like – you know, barnstorming the, the U S and giving like, it's great that they give to charity, but this is, there, there's a threat that is engendering a lot of these decisions that people are, are like just forgetting about. My, we got to move on. My favorite, my favorite thing is when he says, um, Jordan Spieth is so well-spoken. He's one of the best players in the world. He's very, very smart. He's very likable. He's great in these meetings, both on and off the course. Also, I don't understand why people take his opinion more seriously than mine. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, like everything you probably just listed. All right. I, I, I think one, one last thing. I think we, as the first cut, need to start a campaign, James Hahn for PIP. We got to just start Googling his name 24-7, and it will give him a little hush money, like you said, you know? Buddy. Do you know how electric it would be if he was 10th in the PIP? Like, how the, how the hell is James Hahn on this? <laughs> that is an uphill battle. All right. We've got two more things to do. Uh, recap our bets and whoo, whoo, the one and done. First, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. Hey, Calvin, you play golf. You think you can win one of those green jackets at the Masters? Well, if it's for being the most loving neighbor of the year, yes. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. And we're back. Let's just run through these uh, bets real quick. Just show the board here. Uh, Greg, I'll go to you. Keegan over Corey Connors was a winner for me. Keith Mitchell over Tom Kim was a winner for Patrick. Mark got Keegan top 20. The rest were losers. Oh, I love uh, both of the Keegan Bradley plays. Although Corey Connors gave you a little run for your money there. He was looking really good for a while. Um, but yeah, Keegan loves Bay Hill. Playing great this year. Really, really good stuff. And Patrick, Keith Mitchell's been playing some pretty good golf, so good good one there too. Uh, Patrick, I believe this is three best bet wins in a row for you. Keith Mitchell over Tom Kim. Winner. It's a streak officially. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of speechless at the moment. I, I don't usually <laughs> come on You're here and talk check. about winning bets. <laughs> um. But yeah, it it feels good. It feels good. How much am I down? One hundred seventy-one. Uh, don't worry so, about that. You're, you're well, working next, your way out. Next my, week's bet will be about plus three hundred. Get me back to zero. My back, <laughs> my back feels like Spieth's right now, just carrying yes. you guys around on the best bets. Dominating the best bet, seventy-two percent ROI. Another uh, winner for you in the form of Jason Day, top twenty. Cash it. Yeah. I mean, he's been, I, I was listening to Andy Johnson the other day, Friday, he was talking about Jason day at Augusta, which I think is super interesting. He's playing low key, really good golf. It's gotten a little bit overshadowed by all the other top players playing well, but he's been awesome at Augusta as well. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's been kind of cool. A little resurgence of his career so far in 2023. Question about Jason day. Is he in the field for Augusta? I think he's number 47 in the world at the moment. Uh, that's a good question. Did he not finish in the top 50 at the end of last year? Maybe not. Uh, he had some nice finishes in the fall. But probably not because he's been like really uh, good recently. It would be close. Let's see. Yeah, I I'm not sure. Why did the OWGR revert their website back 10 years? Uh, oh, wow. Cool. He was 112th. 
Uh, yeah. He is not, he end is, of the year. According to Masters.com, as of 227, 2023, he is not in the field. But he he will be, right? Well, he's 43rd right now. That's after the API. So they already updated it. Uh, it was match, match plays, the last event. It would be hard to... F- You've probably got some live guys falling out, too. Yeah, I think I think I think it's a favorite that he's in. Yeah. But, all right, one and done. This was uh, a big week. Do we have the graphic? Thank you kindly. From the bottom up, Sia Najad went with Max Homa, three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, moves him to one point three million. Kyle M went with Tony Finau. That was one hundred and fifty-nine thousand, moves him to two million. Greg and Patrick, you guys were in lockstep. Greg, we'll start with you. You started the week with two point. Excuse me. You end the week with two point six million. Uh, you only got forty-six k from Mister Will Zalatoris. Yeah, this one hurts. It kind of played the way I thought. Um, you know, I, I thought the things that would be important are things Will Zalatoris does well. Uh, but it just wasn't meant to be. So now there will be four events throughout this year, at least that I'm kicking myself, kicking myself that I don't have Will Zalatoris in the bank. So this was, this was kind of a tough one. Greg at 2.6, Patrick 2.9 with Will Zalatoris as well. Yeah. Things, uh, there, there's a lot going ahead, uh, going on in my head right now. Uh, I don't know. We were talking about the Green Green Bay Packers earlier. I'm gonna have to do a four day darkness retreat before the players <laughs> or something. Um, I'm scurrying. It's like the SpongeBob meme. He's throwing everything in the fire. Uh, I'm I'm worried. And like Will Zalatoris, I got like three bucks from him. What an idiot move. Uh, yeah. And then the same thing happened with like Patrick Cantley, Cam Young. I'm I'm over it. You know, and no one used John Rom this week, which. It kind of makes matters worse. I wish someone, some more people used them, but I'll stop. Big move, 800K for Kyle. KP, you're up to 3.9 million thanks to one Scott Scheffler. Yeah, this was, uh, it could have gone better. Could have gone worse. The par on 18, or the, the, the five on 18. How much was that putt worth? Like 600K? Yeah, that would have moved him into T2. Uh, yeah, which was like 1.7. So it probably would have been like 1, 1. 1.5, 1. 1.6, something like that. So yeah, 700K. That was tough. Um, but not bad. I mean, it's kind of, it's just tough. Mark's, Mark is like, yeah, running. I mean, Rolling. it's, it's, it's a, it's a lot. I mean, you, it, 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 there's such a difference now between, somebody winning and finishing even T3 or T4, you know, like 3.6 is so much money in this game. And uh, he got two of them early. Uh, The fans are next 6.6 million because they went with Matt Fitzpatrick who got them 325,000. I make the big move. Lone Wolfing with Rory McIlroy, 1.7 million to move to 7.6. But unfortunately, Greg, that is still 2 million behind Mark, who got Terrell Hatton in the bag, which gave him $800,000. Yeah, that's a, that's a great play. It's a great play. And I do think some of these Florida courses, it's hard to play. Uh, the big stars, it's a little less predictable. You can get that John Rom scenario. Like next week, Kyle was talking about this earlier. Ugh. Next week, it's so volatile. Next uh, week's a nightmare. Uh, any one of these guys can miss the cut. So for Mark to pull out Hatton uh, and get nearly another million dollars out of it is just in- incredible. And I know, Rick, you win the week, um, but to me, the I mean, Mark got the most value, the most bang for his buck this week. You think 3.6 million is cool? Yeah. Next week, 4.5 million American dollars. I mean, you can. I need it. Yeah, we all do. I need it. It's like SpongeBob and Sandy's Dome. Just to get back in the, like, you know, in the realm. Yeah, Greg, we're, uh, 
Uh, Kyle's kind of in our neighborhood as well. Who, well, I mean, <laughs> I'm a, he, he, just, he just he just put on like a nice uh, add on like gazebo. Yeah, it, I'm a couple but, streets over from like your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, but we're gentrified. Who, who, you know? it's, who, it's coming this way. Where are you leaning, Patrick? What's your what's your for my pick? So yeah, um, I don't know. I'm completely. Like Mark used Terrell Hatton and he got more money from him combined I, than I use like Zalatoris Cantley. I know. Which is can, I, can I point something out? Um, yeah. Mark has already used John Rom. So he oh, can't yeah. use John Rom. Allegedly. Yeah. How can uh, be? Kyle and, has. And he used Kyle, Scotty as well, right? So he's also used Scotty Scheffler. Yeah. But he, he got like pretty much maxed dollar out of he it. Got he, he got a four he got a no he got a win he got a win from rom at tournament champions which was 2.7 oh, tournament champions was and okay, he got a yeah. win from scotty at phoenix which was 3.6 kyle bef- them both yes before you do anything crazy you've also used john rom <laughs> yeah 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 i'm i'm i remember that and i <laughs> freaking used more cow got me nothing at phoenix kyle m has also Same. used John rom everybody else has rom available Although after watching him this week, I don't yeah, know. Do you feel man. good about it next week? I mean, God. Do I have Do I have Honest Rory? Times. You have Rory available. Yes. Yeah, so I'm the only person who has used Rory. I kind of would love to take uh, Victor, but it's just like everybody's terrifying next week. It's really scary. Because uh, every year, I mean, we see this almost more here than at the majors. Every year, you have like four names, like four big time names miss the cut. And if you're one of those, it's like this is the biggest person. This is the this is the most important one and done week of the year. Four of us have used Scotty Scheffler, Mark, KP, myself, and the fans. Everybody else has Scheffler available. This happens every year for me for one and done where I try to hold on to the big dogs and just completely screw the pooch on when to use them. <laughs> like it's, it's horrendous. Like you, you try to chase them winning and uh, you guys are right. Next week's going to be really bad. Don't miss the cut. Do I not miss the I'm cut next to. week. All right. Uh, real quick on next week. So obviously we'll be back for round by round recaps. We'll have the Monday show, the Tuesday show. We are rocking and rolling. If you're not watching us on YouTube. Also, we are kind of killing it. We've added like 1500 new subscribers on YouTube in the last like 11 days. It's probably strictly because Josh is now on board and we've got graphics and we've got video. and We've got all this fun stuff. So let's, let's keep this rolling. We've got a lot of great golf coming up. We'll continue to pump the content. Uh, just go ahead and, and, and subscribe along the way. Anything else? This is probably the longest part of the year before we get out of here. Much appreciated. Everybody's patience. We had a lot to do tonight. Uh, three open qualifiers. Yeah. Kiyama, English Riley. There you go. Congrats. It's, it's a cool built-in thing that I hope they – obviously, it's a different organization, but I hope the tour leans into it next year with qualifiers for the designated events because I think that's a fun thing to track as the tournament's going on. Yep. All right. That'll do it. Uh, big one coming up next week. Big thanks goes out to producer Josh doing all the hard work behind the scenes. That's Patrick McDonald. You can find him on Twitter at Amateur Status. That's Greg Ducharme at The Real GFD. Kyle Porter at Kyle Porter CBS. And you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut. Catch you next time.